Hello Booktube. Well, I'm in an, a strange location here. I'm out in the other room mainly because, despite the fact that, or maybe because my book room is so warm and toasty, uh, my bed is currently covered in hungover teenagers. <laughs> so so uh, sooner or later I'm going to need to go in there and clear out some space so that Frida and I can at least read. <laughs> but uh, what are you going to do? Uh, I figured while I'm, uh, I'm exiled out here anyway, I might as well do a book tour. Uh, I've, I'm going through these bookshelves of mine with a, a branding iron. I'm going through them on the threshing floor to, uh, oh god, what is the bean doing? Oh. <laughs> Hi, baby. Everybody's looking at you. They don't care what I'm saying. <laughs> That's her little window. She loves to look at the world <laughs> from that window. Uh, but uh, I'm going through these bookshelves anyway, uh, sort of ferociously organizing and pulling things apart in, in, in preparation for a rather extensive uh, book reorganization in 2019. Uh, but And that would have been reason enough to make this, I guess, will be my Vlogmas uh, for today. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, I, I, I totally forgot that when I was up at the little old farmhouse in Vermont visiting Mark Richardson and his family for Thanksgiving, uh, I impulsively did some bookshelf tours. <laughs> One of those has not aired yet, so uh, I'm going to post this bookshelf tour at around the same time that he posts this, the second bookshelf tour that I did of just a random shelf from his epic library. Oh my god, how he fits so many books so neatly into such a tiny space. I do not know. <laughs> it's amazing. I guess you'd have to leave it to a librarian to, to have a book or a book collection that's not only that comprehensive, but that neat. Uh, but I, it was, it, I couldn't keep the hands off the books while I was up there. I was, I was examining things all the time. Uh, so I'll do this bookshelf tour, and I will link down below for those of you who maybe. Uh, I, I mean, I'm assuming that that most of you know Mark Richardson's channel. Uh, but uh, if you don't, <laughs> allow me to give you a little thumbnail introduction. He's, uh, he's been, he's a well-traveled, <laughs> well-seasoned person. He is not the typical booktube ingenue. Uh, and he's owned and lost bigger libraries than most of us have had. And in addition to having a big and well-organized library in his personal life, he also has a tiny and well-organized library in his professional life. He's the head librarian of the cutest little library you've ever seen in, 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 in tiny town Vermont. The number of books in his library's collection is significantly smaller than the number of books in his own collection. <laughs> and yet it's a thriving center. Uh, it's it's not a you know a anachronistic curio on the edge of town. People use it. It's uh, it's amazing to hear him tell stories. It's amazing. Uh, so I'll leave a link to his channel, and I think today he will probably be posting my other bookshelf tour, just a random bookshelf tour. This bookshelf tour that we're doing today is not completely random, uh, because once again, since I'm exiled out here, uh, I, this is biography, uh, but it's not anything like what the biography section is going to look like when it's done. Uh, when it's reorganized, it's going to look it's going to look much better. Right now, it's a hodgepodge. Even in under the category of biographies, it's still a hodgepodge. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll start with these two. It looks like a a paired set. Oh yes. Oh my. Okay. I I have mentioned many times uh, on this channel that I here in Boston there's a used bookstore called the Brattle Bookshop, and it's amazing. It's three stories of great used books. The first two stories are just ordinary used bookstore fare. Uh, arranged alphabetically and in subjects and priced moderately. And then the third floor is collectible items, uh, first editions of stuff you might want to give as a gift or something like that. And then next to the store, there's a lot uh, that's full of bargain books, $3, $5, and $1 bargain books. I admit I, uh, my attendance at the Brattle has dropped off <laughs> in, in part because uh, Frida doesn't really like going there and I don't like leaving her and also in part because once upon a time I went to the Brattle every day and that that entails going to the Brattle in brutal weather extremes and for some reason <laughs> perhaps because 28 is no spring chicken I don't find it as enjoyable to be browsing the outside carts at the Brattle when it's 30 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 degrees Fahrenheit or today 15 degrees Fahrenheit I don't find it enjoyable. <laughs> the pain far outweighs the serendipity of discovery. So I, my attendance at the Brattle has dropped off. But one of the amazing things about the Brattle sale lot is that you will find things like the books I'm going to show you 
where in another used bookstore, somewhere else, some other used bookstore would almost certainly have classified these things as enormously uh, rare or collectible and be charging $60 for them. And instead, these were a dollar a piece. The, the, this is a two-volume autobiography, and it cost me $2. <laughs> and it's this. It's the memoirs of the Duke of Argyll, uh, who was a... Uh, a Victorian Puba, a member of the the great storied Victorian royal class, the 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 noble class under uh, under Queen Victoria, and then his under uh, a little bit later in the Edwardian era, where where they had these vast estates and they they paid virtually nothing in taxes, and they they a lot of them viewed it as their civic duty that since they had been given so much by circumstance, they should give back so they would serve the government. Which is why, for so long, the government, you know, ministerial positions and whatnot, were unpaid, <laughs> because because most of the people in the professional class, so to speak, or people who filled those offices, didn't need the money, uh, and it was only it was only at the very end of Victoria's reign that that uh, well, social protesters had been saying it for a while, but it was only at the end of Victoria's reign that it, people started to point out that that is kind of prejudicial. <laughs> that does sort of lay a burden it doesn't it doesn't look like it does but it sort of lays a burden on who will serve in public office and it guarantees that the very rich will write the laws of the country and that maybe that's not completely fair and uh this man uh, led a fascinating life and this is just uh it's his autobiography he worked on it for a long long time and died before he could finish it uh and it's a whole bunch of uh of memoirs of him by other people and also tons and tons of notes uh just absolutely fascinating look into you know, firsthand into the the you know the nuts and bolts operation of of the Victorian era just the type of thing that you will that you might see summarized or epitomized in a history of the period even a really good history of the period but it's not the same thing it's not the same thing as reading something that someone wrote not knowing that they were living in history so to speak uh, and it's the kind of thing that you find at the brattle for an affordable price I find these things all the time at the battle for an affordable price. Uh, okay, these next three are examples of the same thing. Uh, and another is another uh, two-volume Edwardian political memoir by a, a, a noble mucky muck in the Victorian and Edwardian era. And this is Gray of Falodon. That's how he called himself. That's how people thought of him. Falodon was his family home in the country, and that and his name was Gray. So, and these are his. Uh, um, memoirs of his time in office. We've seen him already. He was uh, in, on this channel a couple of times. He's he was a uh, eloquent, of course, in the way that the, the the upper classes in the Victorian era were just taught how to write. It was it's just a common thing for them. Uh, and he was also he took government service for most of his life and ended up doing a lot of pivotal things. He was he was uh, he was essentially uh, a living embodiment of the British government right in the era of World War One, when it was so crucial, <laughs> when it was so crucial to make good decisions and sound decisions. And he's a, a fascinating figure, and he was also a fascinating public figure. Uh, gave all sorts of lectures and wrote uh, other books in addition to his memoirs. And here is another one. This is a collection of those little addresses called Falodon Papers, uh, which on, on being a public figure, on reading, on... Uh, gardening and that sort of thing whatever whatever occurred to him to write and i found these all at the brattle and they weren't up in the collectible shelf they weren't up on the third floor they were out in the sale lot because the brattle prices things realistically and they they know their business they know the business of of old and collectible books so i always want to sneer a little at the uh those insectile creatures the the uh, the online book dealers that have the programs on their phone that, where they can scan an ISBN and see what it's going for and maybe make a nickel profit if they search all day at the used bins of a library sale or a Goodwill or whatever. And when I see those creatures in the Brattle sale lot, I don't see them often because they don't go there often. And there's a reason for that. And that's the reason that I want to snicker at them. When I see them, I want to say, you're not going to find any bargains, uh, any any killer deals out here. Everyone in here Everyone who works for this shop has been trained by the greatest book assessor in the country. <laughs> so they're not letting any Gutenbergs go by here. You're wasting your time and you're soiling the whole experience for the rest of us. But, uh, huh. but these things, you know, they might, for a curiosity in some other bookstore, they might be 
priced up, but the, the folks at the Brattle just realistically determined that aside from freaks like me, no one's interested in them. <laughs> I, I shudder to think how many books like these uh, go through their life cycle in the sale lot and just get thrown away. I'm sure that hundreds and hundreds of them do. At no loss to the Brattle, that money is never going to be made. You could, it would be ridiculous to put a $60 price tag on these things. Uh, but at great loss to Steve. <laughs> so, so there we go. That was a, that was a blast of, of uh, Edwardian memoirs to start off. Aren't you, aren't you glad you clicked on this video? Uh, so let's see if we can do any better. Oh, okay, great. Okay, this is Larry Sabato's The Kennedy Half Century. Uh, a great, great book that, uh, I mean, it's, it's a long book. And at the halfway point, uh, Kennedy is assassinated. And the whole point of the book, I mean, it tells the, the Kennedy era really well, really a really good job, probably the second best job I've seen done. Uh, but the, the point of the book is the long shadow of the Kennedy, of the Kennedy administration. So you, you've got Carter in here, you've got um, Ronald Reagan in here, you've got a lot on Edward Kennedy in here. Uh, and I thought it was all just well, well done. Not, it's hard to find a well done Kennedy book. Uh, and, and this one was clear-eyed, balanced, the type of thing that JFK would have liked to read himself. Uh, so I, I was happy to find it, again, at the Brattle for a dollar. <laughs> I had a copy of it from the publisher, but God knows where it went. Uh, this next one is, oh, well, this is old, okay. Okay, this is by Elswith Thane. We saw this already. This is Potomac Squire. Isn't that lovely? Look at that. Uh, that, is, that is Mount Vernon. Minus the slaves, of course, uh, since it, even if this had been a photograph and a slave had wandered into the picture, they would have been beaten mercilessly. Uh, but this is this is her uh, very affectionate uh, book about George Washington. Uh, she was I love I love this is a picture. She was quite the sight. Yes, <laughs> uh, this is her. It's it's uh, I found it uh, you know dirt cheap and I got it and uh, I have. She wrote a bunch of books. And a couple of them are on Washington. One, a, a famous one that did her did really much better than it was expected by its publisher was a book on Martha Washington, who's getting a new book in 2019 uh, that will almost certainly reference this author that no one's ever heard of anymore. Uh, and uh, Potomac Squire is good. I, I am no fan of George Washington, so the the absolutely inevitable elements of of hero worship are great on me. But they, they here they're poised and they're they're balanced with a great deal of eloquence in the pen, so I didn't sell much of mine. <laughs> oh, okay. Talk about eloquence of the pen. Good Lord. This is James Thomas Flexner. This is, he wrote a four-volume biography of George Washington. This is the volume of Washington during the Revolution. Uh, and it's fantastic. All four volumes are, and also his one-volume uh, abridgment of his own work, Washington, the Indispensable Man, is incredible. It's, I, of course, don't agree with the title of the book. I don't agree with most of the hero worship. But boy, oh boy, is Flexner great. He is just fantastic. And this, uh, the, I've read his four volumes. I would love to have all four of them. When I find them, I get them, and then I give them away. So, so this is currently the only Flexner volume that I have. And it's also the one that I'm most interested in. Uh, but uh, aside from the hero worship of Washington, the, his portrait of Washington's people and age is incredible, incredibly detailed, and yet incredibly readable. And I, I read, you know, a bit, a chunk, a bit, a piece of one of these things, some theme or story, his relationships with, uh, with Alexander Hamilton, his relationships with Congress, uh, the surrender at Yorktown. And then I read a, a modern book on that same subject, and it's, even though it's the sole focus of that modern book, it's not as good. Uh, so I, I cannot recommend these books highly enough, even though they are not critical of George Washington. They, they think they are, but they're not. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Oh, oh, fantastic. Okay. Uh, this is uh, W. Jackson Bate. This is his big biography of Samuel Johnson. I, uh, I might object just a bit to the marble bust of Johnson on the cover, because it, it, A, it doesn't look like Johnson. It looks like Johnson dead. And there's a reason for that. <laughs> and also, B, uh, it doesn't give the affect of, of Johnson. Johnson was uh, a, a great shapeshifter, an immense uh, brain, uh, social misfit, uh, a collection of weaknesses that somehow added up to strength. And it, for that, you want... Uh, there are a couple of famous drawings and paintings of him taken when, done when he was alive that, uh, that capture 
the furious ball of self-contradictory and often self-destructive energy that he was. I'd rather that be on the cover of this, but but I love this book. Oh my God, Bate is so good. We saw him just recently with his Keats biography, and his Johnson biography is every bit as good. It's incredible. Uh, what do we got here? Another big one. Oh, okay. This is the Downing Street Years uh, by Margaret Thatcher. This is uh, her her enormous uh, history of her own time in office uh, that was, uh, you know, heavily written by other people, researched by her staff. Uh, but there's a lot of her in this book, a lot more than there needed to be. She could simply have, tur have turned up once a month for coordination meetings of 15 minutes and that's it and instead she was involved in this book and it has the flavor of her of her uh, speech the flavor of her mind uh, and uh, regardless of what you think of the of the reign of Margaret Thatcher or her political legacy this is a terrific book absolutely terrific it, it is meaty and readable and uh, has sharp elbows in a way that the big fat books of her famous contemporaries are not. And that's a shame because that was an era. The, the 1980s was an era. We had gigantic titans on the world stage. Imagine how richer we would be if all of them had written great books, had written books like this, and they didn't. <laughs> that's, that's a bit of a shame. Uh, but I recommend this one, believe it or not, even though it's a relatively contemporary political memoir, I still do. Uh, Oh, okay, William Manchester, The Last Lion, another multi-volume biography, in this case of uh, Winston Churchill. There he is as uh, Bertie Wooster. And this is, this is his uh, youth and young manhood in the late Victorian era and the Edwardian era that really shaped him. Uh, and I, I admit, I, uh, I mainly have this for Manchester's writing. Manchester has a very idiosyncratic, very catchy style of writing and... I mean, I know the story, and I have other Churchill biographies. I mainly have this for the writing, and uh, I really enjoy it. I, like with all of the books that I'm showing you, I periodically pull these off the shelf, not usually when it's 10 degrees out here in this room, but uh, but I, I periodically pull these off the shelf and just reread chunks of them or even the whole thing for enjoyment, which is exactly the relationship that I want to have with all of my books. Not some, not just in biography, all of them. The only justification for having a book on your shelf is that you have that relationship with it. If you have any other kind of relationship with it, sell it and use it at the library. <laughs> the only relationship that justifies you keeping a book on your shelf, apartment to apartment, year after year, is that you regularly go to it for sheer enjoyment of its company. And these are all examples of that. This is you. You notice you have not heard me say the usual refrain of a li of a library tour bookshelf is I don't know why I have this or I don't know what this is doing here or I vaguely remember this. You won't hear that with any of these, because I go back to these and and I enjoy them and I use them and that's uh, that's how it should be with books in your personal collection. Uh, so let's see what this. Uh, oh, okay, great. This is Royston Lambert. This is uh, Beloved and God his controversial book about the Emperor Hadrian and his 18-year-old super hottie uh, teenager Antinous, who uh, he, he fell into lust with and then came to know and like when Antinous ended up drunk on his bed <laughs> any number of times. When, when, and when, when Hadrian, Hadrian liked the company of young men, not just romantically, but also just their company they, they personally it kept him feeling active mentally active and young and this is the most famous example of that that history provides because Hadrian took him as a favorite named towns after him erected countless statues Every, any, anyone at a small civic board in some small town on the wrong end of the Mediterranean who was looking for an imperial grant of a little bit of money would carve a statue a beautiful statue of Antinous uh and send it to Rome, hoping to curry the emperor's favor. That's why we have a whole museum full of statues of Antinous. Uh, and Antinous came to a, a horrible end as well, as those of you who've read the Memoirs of Hadrian by Margaret Yorsar, a great historical novel, will we'll remember. Uh, he killed himself, and we don't know exactly why. The circumstances are plumbed in this book. This is still the best book on Hadrian and Antinous. And one of the best books on Hadrian. 
just in general. The author didn't have to be this this good on Hadrian himself, and yet he is. I myself don't find Hadrian a particularly sympathetic figure historically, of course, since I researched and then wrote a novel on Hadrian's predecessor, Trajan. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, uh, I love the book. Absolutely love it. Uh, it, it in, in a less disciplined book collection, this would be right alongside the, the memoirs of Hadrian by Marguerite Yersenar. You see, you often see them together in used bookstores. And uh, if you're a bookish person, you will have the same urge I always do, which is to fix it. <laughs> so this doesn't belong here. One of these is history, and one of them is not is a novel, so they don't belong together. I control that impulse nowadays. <laughs> oh, oh, all right. Oh, this is in terrible shape. This needs to be re this needs to be uh, reinforced right away. I will do that right now. Uh, this is uh, Byron, a portrait by Leslie Marchand. This is his his uh, sort of Synopsis, a, a beautiful one-volume abridgment of his much larger work on, on Byron uh, that is still pound for pound the best biography of Byron that there is, even though even in the last 25 years there have been three or four really big ones, some of which have been really good, and have filled in noticeable uh, weak spots of this biography. Uh, mainly, uh, Marchand is a little less than candid in, in probing Byron's homosexuality, for instance. Uh, and he's a little too easy on the, the sham heroics that characterized Byron's last few years. Uh, main, those, those sham heroics were what we would, now would we would now call a midlife crisis. And always his biographers are right at that stage of their life when they write about them. So they, all of a sudden, the stuff that seems evidently suicidal becomes heroic and quixotic and all that nonsense. Uh, so there are weaknesses in this book that can be amended and, you know, and fleshed out by later books. But as a whole... Uh, I, I, I mean, uh, it's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Notice it's all alone here. There are other biographies of Byron here, other studies of Byron all over this place. They should all be together. And once upon a time they were, and then I would pull a book down because I needed it, and I would use it, and then I would put it back in the nearest open space, even if it was next to Star Trek. And, and then after a while of that, after a few years of that, no one, nothing is where it belongs, so we're going to fix that. <laughs> we're going to fix that. So I, I highly recommend this. It's not in print. It never will be again. So you'd have to find it in a used bookstore. But if you're interested in Byron, you could do worse than to find this book and skip the modern books until you've read this one, because this, they're, they're all, in, in a sense, in a dialogue with, with Marchand. Uh, and then we've got the last book here. Oh, <laughs> Amanda Foreman's great Georgiana <laughs> by the Duchess of Devonshire. This is such a book. This is such a book. I never know quite what to make of it. I grab it all the time. Like, for instance, now this is in a, a rather flimsy trade paperback, just because I, I'm sure that the last hardcover that I grabbed I gave away right away. I'm sure that that's what happened. Uh, I give it away all the time because it's so luxurious. It's such a wonderful reading experience. And I, I hate to think that its publication date coinciding with the death of Princess Diana is what caused it to become a gigantic bestseller, just a massive bestseller. I'd like to think that it would have found that large an audience on its own because it's so wonderful, but maybe not. One way or another, I don't care as long as the book succeeds when it should. I don't care what the reason is. And boy, oh boy, if you have seen this in used bookstores or in your library and your, or even in your new bookstore, it's still in print and it always will be, at least for another 50 years. Uh, and you're wondering, you know, I've heard all about this, there's a lot of fuss about it, is it really good? Oh my, it is really good. <laughs> it is really, really good. <laughs> well, it's just stuck down here. Now see, that we're going to have to fix that because the, the, none of this, I mean, this was, this was, that's it, that's our, that's our shelf and this was a great shelf of books, but none of it makes any sense. You can see Frida up there. So she does. She just goes up to her window and looks out at the world. Uh, but she isn't all that interested in going out into the world. She looks at it, but she's sometimes indifferent when I when I ask her if she wants to go outside. Uh, but anyway, that you can see from this one bookshelf tour that this is a mishmash of things. This is ancient biography, 20th century biography, political biography, British biography, Greek, Roman. It, it needs better order, and I will give it that better order in the new year. <laughs> but in the meantime, I'm going to wrap this up before it goes to 30 minutes. So I'll wrap this up. That is a, li uh, a shelf tour from my library. And at the same time over at Mark's channel, you'll be able to see uh, me do an impromptu shelf tour from his library as well. I don't remember what was in that tour, but uh, we'll find out together. So I'll leave a link down below. Uh, and I'll see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.